Turn to John chapter 5 and just briefly I'll share with you um, John, it says we're not on Facebook, but or somebody's telling me we're not on Facebook. Can somebody pull their phone out and go to our... It is. Okay, all right. So anyway, um, turn to John chapter 5, and I'll tell you this brief story of... And I never did get a chance to talk to the guy... Uh, that weekend, and it, I'm, he may have avoided me because I saw him, and I told him that I wanted to talk to him further. But he, when we were setting up our table there at the uh, at the conference center, um, <clears throat> these uh, it was just for that time. It was just people setting up their vendor table. And I guess these two guys, they were there for the conference, and I don't really, I don't think they had a vendor table, so they may have just showed up early just to see what was going on. But it was an older guy, and I interviewed him. He was on one of the clips that I showed, and he had a younger guy with him. And of course, they both came in in military caps. And you know me, the first thing I do is I stick my hand out, and I tell them, thank you for serving your country, and so on. And... Um, the younger man uh, told me that he had, he had had what he believed to be an abduction experiences. Now, I'm saying it that way because um, there is fact, actual factual evidence that people have disappeared. Uh, in their physical body has disappeared. Um, there have been people who have seen people and it's almost like they wanted, they wanted this to be seen by certain people, uh, floating out of a house and going up into a ship. Um, my original thought was that this was all something that the, a, a devil was planting in their mind, that experience. Uh, but I, I've since come to believe at least some of the reports that I'm hearing that these people have actually come up missing for hours or in some cases even days. And um, so anyway, this young man was telling me that he had had abduction experiences. And he said, I, he said, I believe myself to be a Christian but he said, and it made, but it made me angry at God. Because he said, why is, I don't understand, why is God allowing this to happen to me? And he, I mean, he was looking right at me, asking me this question. Now, I can tell you that people all over the world experience satanic um, encounters in varying ways. They're not all just UFO experiences. The devil plays a lot of different games. He's not just limited to one. And um, a lot of these, a lot of these games, he's well, all these games he plays. Some of them may start out feeling really good, sounding really good. The experience might be something that they really enjoy, but afterwards it just gets downright evil and painful. And um, I told him at that time that I said, I want to talk to you this weekend. I said, because I have biblical answers for you. And what I would have told this young man, and I, he may be watching tonight, I don't know, but what I would have told this young man was, God allows these things for a reason. It's like asking the question, when you got caught up in whatever sins of your past you got caught up in, and you look back now and you say, God, why did you let me go get in that sin for? God, why did you allow that to happen in my life? It was God's way of drawing you to the cross, causing you to lean on Him, causing you to understand that you're not going to get through this life on your own two feet. 
God's going to do with you what he did with Jacob of old. When he wrestled Jacob, he crippled him. Jacob had asked, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Well, the Lord plays dirty, right? He reaches out and he touches his thigh and pulls his thigh, his hip out of socket. And the Bible says that Jacob walked with a halt, with a limp, the rest of his life. But he walked into heaven that way. And um, I'm telling you, what God does to you, he always does for you. That's my experience. That's what I would have, that's what I've told this man. Uh, had he made himself available to me, uh, and I really did. I really wanted to, I really wanted to spend some time visiting with him and share with him, uh, the scriptures. Uh, but for some reason, it just, I don't know if the devil just stepped in and said, are you not going to talk to this guy or what? I don't know. But anyway, you pray for him. John chapter 5, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate all you folks online with us. Those of you watching, uh, we love you. Thank God for you. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for this night you've given us. And Lord, Father, we're about to enter into a change of seasons. Things are about to get different now. And Lord, that happens in our life. We have a change of seasons. We have uh, good days and we have bad days. And Father, every one of those good days, Lord, we rejoice in them. We thank you for them. And Father, help us, dear God, to rejoice also in the bad days. Lord, those are days that you never left us. You never forsaken us. You've not given up on us. Father, you're there to teach us. You're there to, to train us. You're there to help us. You're there to discipline us and make us fit disciples for your kingdom. Father, you're, you're desiring to bring forth and manifest fruitful lives in our lives. And Lord, that's what we desire. We desire, Lord, that you make us good branches for the vine. To bear the fruit, Father, of the kingdom of God. To shine forth as lights in the midst of an evil and a perverse and a very dark world. And Father, as this world turns darker and darker and darker, I pray, dear God, that your light would shine through us brighter and brighter and brighter each day. Polish us, sharpen us. Uh, Lord, um, expunge things off of us, take things away from us, Lord, and just, just make us right for your kingdom. Let us be a blessing to those around us, especially our family, our friends, our church members, our brothers and sisters, the people that we meet every day, the, the people we work with every day. Help us to be a blessing to each one of them. And Lord, just bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Um, tell you what let's do. John chapter, well, I told you John chapter 5. What I meant was John chapter 6. That's what I really meant. John chapter 6. Starting a new chapter in the Gospel of John. Uh, there was a, uh, you pray for a man. I'm going to try, I'm, as I, time goes on, I'm going to remember some of these encounters that I had over the weekend. And um, I met a man that said he used to be Muslim. He spoke, he, I, he, at one point I heard him say that he was from Iran and he was a former Muslim, but he didn't really know what he was at that particular time. He said, I believe in a, a universal God. And I've heard that statement. What that means is generally he believes in a God that can be called by different names. In fact, he spelled out to me, Sort of what he believes, because I, I, I politely stood my ground with him. He told me a little bit about his experience in Islam. I said, well, let me tell you about my experience with Jesus Christ. I said, he said something about them being the same God. And I said, however, I said, the God of Islam, if I, if I am saying this right, Allah has no son. Is that correct? And he said, yes. I said, the God that I believe in has an only begotten son. His name was Jesus Christ. 
And I said, so how can the God of Islam and my God be the same God? He said, that's an interesting point. He was sharp. And here's what he did. He said, I believe here there is a one God. And he said to these people, there is a, he has made a God called Allah. To these people, he has made a God called Jehovah, who has a son, Jesus Christ. To these people, I guess 330 million gods to the Hindus. And that's how he presented it. And at the end of the conversation, I said, I want to encourage you to do something. He said, what's that? I said, get a Bible out and read the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. I said, and I quoted, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that Word was Jesus Christ. I said, what you heard me quote to you all ago was from the Gospel of John. I said, I would like for you to read the entire book of John. It's only 21 chapters, and I promise you, you'll enjoy it. But I'm going to pray for you that God will shine His light down into your heart and show you who the real God is. So you pray for that man too. All right, John chapter 6. Because this God, I like this God. This God, whose son is Jesus Christ, the son of God, is also God. Amen. And if God can do miracles, Jesus can do miracles. And he does it here. John chapter 6 verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. He had gone and he had healed lame men. He had healed blind men. And uh, later on, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead when we get to John chapter 11. They haven't seen that yet, but they've already seen that he can perform miracles, that he can heal diseases. And so he naturally has people following him around. Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now, now there's two things here that I just want to point out. This, the practical aspect of it and the symbolic aspect of it. For practical reasons... He's, he's climbing up on a mountain, probably standing on a ledge for the reason so that people can see him and that as he speaks to them, his voice can carry. He's got the mountain behind him, so his voice is going to reverberate from the mountain behind him. It's sort of like the Hollywood Bowl, if you've ever seen that. It's basically just a big big bowl that they have on a cliff in Hollywood, California. It's where they do all these concerts and it's shaped like a bowl so that an orchestra can get in there and play their music and it carry out and they don't need microphones. That's what they did back before they had microphones. So Jesus is standing there for a practical reason so that he can be seen and heard by the people that are following. There's also a symbolic nature to it. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. I think this is a beautiful, a beautiful illustration of Christ coming into his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Mountains in the Bible represent that well, they represent heaven because of up high. Moses ascends up to Mount Sinai. It's a picture of Christ. And when he descends from Mount Sinai, it's a picture of Christ coming down from heaven. Mountains also represent kingdoms. So mountains, in this particular case, this mountain represents the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 2, the stone cut without hands when it, when it crushes the feet of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, the whole image fell, disintegrated, and turned into chaff, and the wind blew it away, and the stone became a great mountain, and it covered the entire earth. That mountain, then, is a picture of a kingdom. 
uh, in Revelation 17 when it describes the seven heads of the beast. He said the seven heads are seven mountains upon whom the whore sitteth upon. But they also represent seven kings. Well, kings are kingdoms. So here is Christ now, Matthew chapter 5. He comes up to a mountain and his disciples came unto him. This is, I think, a picture of us being, being brought up to Jesus Christ as he begins his thousand year reign to rule. We're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So back in John chapter 6, the same thing I see here. Um, Jesus, verse 3, went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. It shows his authority. It shows him being king of kings and lord of lords. He is reigning over these people. He speaks and he speaks with authority. In verse 4, it says, The Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, ask yourself the question, does Jesus already know the answer to this question? Of course he does. Okay? Remember, he has already said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. He is following the script that God has written for him. He's following the book. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows how things are going to happen. He knows that he's about ready to perform a miracle. But he's asking, and I want you to capture this. God will ask you similar questions throughout life. How is it that this can be done? And our response is, Lord, I have no idea how this can be done. God asked me one time, Mike, do you trust me? And I was going to lie and say, of course, Lord, I trust you. I'm Mike Hoggard. Everybody knows Mike Hoggard trusts the Lord. And the Holy Ghost said, don't say it because you'll be lying. And I know you're lying. You don't trust me. You trust yourself. And that was a hard one to swallow, but I understood what God was getting at. So God will ask us questions every now and then. He, of course, knows the answer. But he asked Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, I checked with, and I did this years ago, back when I was really looking, when I first started looking at numbers in the Bible and how the King James stood out above the different translations. And I'm looking at this passage and I'm asking the question why Philip gave the answer that he gave, 200 penny worth. So, and, and I'm sort of taking what I've learned of numbers already and I'm applying it and I think I get it. And I'll explain it to you in a little bit. So then I checked the NIV and that was back some 20 some odd years ago. They've altered the NIV since then. So I checked it just last week. Uh, and it sure enough, it says something similar to this. Um, actually, they've actually changed the language. Back 20 some odd years ago, the NIV said, has Philip saying, Lord, a month's wages is not enough to, to buy bread for these people. And I think now they've changed it to six months wages is not enough. I guess in 25 years, inflation. Now, the Greek does not say that. The Greek does not say a month's wages or six months' wages. That's because the NIV is not a literal translation of the Bible. They use what they called, oh, what do they call it? I don't know, something rotten and dirty. Um, but they tell you what they think it means. So if you don't know what value 200 penny worth would have had back in Jesus' day, then the NIV is going to tell you, first it's going to tell you 20 years ago that it was a month's wages. Now it's going to tell you six months' wages or something like that. I may not be remembering it all correct, but anyway, you get the idea. They're not sticking with the literal Greek 
the literal translation of the Bible. They're giving you what they think. It's, it's called dynamic equivalence. That's what I was trying to remember. They're trying to say that even though Philip said 200 penny worth, they have the right to say to you that equals six months wages. But that then takes away from what this means and what I believe it implies. I think the number's there for a reason. So Jesus asked Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said, you can underline this in your Bible, to prove him for himself, for he himself knew what he would do. He knew what he was going to do. He knew the miracle that he was going to perform. Jesus knew the little boy that was going to show up. Jesus knew him before the foundation of the earth, the foundation of the world. He knew all of these things ahead of time. That's what makes him God. And he's the one that brings, I mean, how is it that he knows this boy is going to be at this spot at this particular time and that nothing is going to hinder that? He knows it because he's God. And so Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is, and there's more numbers here in this parable that I'm going to try to explain to you as we move along and why I think you don't mess with them. If it says 200 penny worth, leave it alone. It, it has a value. It's there for a reason. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Now, the idea that two is not sufficient. When we have the number two in the Bible, uh, it refers to witnesses. Out of the mouth of two witnesses shall, it, you, uh, shall every word be established. Uh, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's your two witnesses. You have the first coming of Christ, second coming of Christ. For God speaketh once, yea, twice in a dream and a vision. Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. The first time they rejected it, he goes up. He comes down again the second time they accept it. Um, when Joseph was um, put into bondage, he serves and then he's thrown into prison. But after he's taken out of prison, he is given um, the daughter of the priest of On as his wife, and he, which is a Gentile. He marries a Gentile bride and has two sons. And you find this so... The, the 200 penny worth, the equivalent of the number two, I believe it represents the two days or the 2,000 years of the Gentile age. This is, there is going to be a prophecy concerning Israel. There is a practical application to this. There is a prophecy concerning Israel. And I have up on the screen, Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. Now I want you to notice that in each one of these, one of these is accepted, the other one's rejected. Ishmael is the firstborn son, but he's rejected. He's not the child of promise. Isaac was. Esau was the firstborn son, but he sold his birthright. Jacob, and God had told um not Sarah, who's Isaac's wife? Rebecca. Two manner of nations are in thy womb. Two different types of seed are in thy womb. Two completely different types of people are in your womb. Esau rejected. Jacob accepted. Rachel and Leah. Rachel's the true love of Jacob. But when he wakes up with the wife that he was given the first night, it's not Rachel, it's Leah. And so he has to work another seven years for Rachel. Joseph marries a Gentile bride, has two sons, feeds his brethren after 22 years. Joshua marches the Ark of the Covenant, 2,000 cubits in front of Israel at the River Jordan. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2, after, this is a prophecy here. After two days will he revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. A day with the Lord is how long? A thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. 
So from Christ's first coming to Christ's second coming, 2,000 years are going, to, are going to pass. They're going to expire. And then at the beginning of that third day, you have that in the story of the Israelites gathered at Mount Sinai that says that after two days, on the third day, early in the morning, Moses took Israel and met with God at the base of Mount Sinai. He brought the people up to meet with God. That's what's going to happen here. I don't know when God started counting to 2,000 years, the two days, but we're, we're getting in there. Somewhere we're getting in there, and I believe Christ is going to appear in the air. He's going to take us into heaven, and he's going to restore Israel. How many tribes? Twelve. That's important. That's going to play into this. So the number 200 Pennyworth, when I looked at this and I, and I saw that they changed it, and I, it made me mad. And I'm going, think about what he's saying here. During this 2,000 years, God's not going to give bread to the Jews. He's not going to feed them. He's left them for the most part. Yeah, there's been a few Jews gotten saved. But for the most part, even the Apostle Paul said, I'm no longer going to another synagogue to preach ever again. I'm going to just go to the Gentiles. And he just gave up completely. But Paul had a prayer in Romans 11. Brethren, my, heart's desire, my prayer and my heart's desire is that all Israel shall be saved. And so in Revelation 7, we see the two groups very clearly, just like the two sons. We see Israel set apart, sealed with the seal of God in their foreheads, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. And they're scattered all over the earth, but God's going to gather them together again. And then we have the uh, unlimited number of people that no man can number, of every nation, kindred, tongue, and tribe of the earth. They're gathered around the throne with palms in their hands. Those are the Gentiles. They're the ones who have come out of great tribulation and so on. So Philip answering him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient. Is tell, this is another way of God signifying, I'm not going to deal with Israel during this two days or this 2,000 years. But after those two days, I'm going to deal with them again. Does that make sense to everybody? 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient. And remember, Jesus asked this specifically of Philip, knowing what Philip would answer. Now, it just might turn out that 200 penny worth might be a half a year's wages or six months wages. I don't know. But that's not the important part. The important part is that the number is there. And it's insufficient that everyone may take a little. Even if we had that much, it's not going to be enough. But remember, when God has a little, what can he do with it? If you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed. What can be done with that kind of faith? It can turn into a whole great tree, can it? And of course, we know, we know now. I mean, he said mustard seed. I guess mustard seed's pretty small. I've never seen seeds in a jar of mustard. That was a joke. Yes, I will be here all week. But we now know what he's talking about. Seed is the word of God. If you'll have faith in this book, DNA, how small is DNA? Jim, it's so small we can't even see it. In the best microscope we have, we can't see it. It's smaller than the light waves that shine on it so we can't see it it's too small and yet that much seed well that's what produced me and you okay so i have up here ex nihilo that's one of those smart terms i learned in theology class who knows their latin 
ex nihilo. Ex means out of. Nihilo is where we get the word annihilate. When you annihilate something, what do you turn it into? Nothing. Ex nihilo means out of nothing. Okay? And they use that term to describe the creation. What did God create the entire universe out of? Nothing. And see, even the Big Bang theory isn't right. Because the Big Bang theory says that all the matter in the universe was in a very dense microscopic point and it exploded. So it says that it actually started out of something. And Stephen Hawking, that guy in the wheelchair all crumpled up, who they say is the smartest guy in the world, he couldn't figure out when he got to the Big Bang where that original amount of matter or mass came to create the universe. So he eventually had to say something must have made all that mass that was all in that point of cosmic dust that made everything. He falls short of saying, I believe in God, but he can't figure out what it was that created all of that mass that is now everything that we see. And yet our God created it out of nothing. So now we're going to see the same thing again. How do you get 12 baskets of bread out of five loaves? Where, where did the oil come from? The widow and her son are pouring oil into all these borrowed cruises and buckets and jars that they're getting from their neighbors. Where is the oil coming from? Nowhere. It's just being created out of nothing. What were you before Jesus found you? Nothing. John 6, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. See the number two? The fish, what is that? What, is, what do you think the fish represent? If you say Pisces, I'm going to pop you. What was Peter? What did Jesus tell him? I will make you fishers of men. There's actually a prophecy where God says, I'm going to send the fishers out after Israel. And they're going to fish them out. So there is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. In number about 5,000. But we know we have more. We have their women. And we have their children. So, you could say probably 15, 20, 25,000 people. But 5,000 men. What's that number? What is that number there for? Okay, it's there for a reason. So the men sat down, verse 10, in number about 5,000, verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, people always give thanks for what you eat. Even if you think we have plenty, and we'll always have plenty, we may not always have plenty. Now, I, I don't like to scare people, but what if, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to see some things that I'm not happy with. The number of places that don't want me to pay with cash anymore. I don't like that. And they're saying it's because there's a shortage of change because of COVID. 
I've never seen hospital beds with change in them that has the COVID virus. No COVID virus can infect change. Change doesn't die of COVID. Okay, that's another joke. I'll be here all week telling them. Okay, quarters don't catch COVID. So I don't buy it. I think that they want, find, they want electronic transactions because they are easier to track you. If you make an electronic payment, then your payment goes into a database with the exact number of dollars, what exactly you bought, and that information gets sold, and it's, and it's more valuable than gold now. How does Google and Microsoft and Apple and how are these companies running the world and Amazon? It's because they know what you want. They know what you eat. They know what you buy. They know everything about you. They know stuff about you. You don't know about yourself. They know about you. And it's only going to get worse. And I don't like that because... Cash cannot be controlled by any entity, whether it's a private company or a government. Electronic transactions can be controlled. And if you don't have the right papers, like vaccination papers, they say, well, we, you can't use your money. It's in a bank and we're going to stop your bank account and now you have nothing to eat don't don't get scared at that god was feeding people long before you ever showed up okay i don't like it but don't let it scare you so be thankful for what you have he distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes, as many as they would. In other words, take all you want. Like Jaden during homecoming when he saw the plate of bacon. Right? He took all he wanted, didn't he? He said, boy, I sure like bacon. That's a hoggard right there, I'm telling you. That comes out of me, my side of the family. Uh, as, as much as they would, verse 12, and they were filled. By the way, barley, barley, barley bread is a poor man's bread. Okay, because barley and the Germans, they can eat that stuff all they want to. They like it. Uh, but it's a brown grain. It makes a brown bread. And it's just not... It doesn't taste to me like sweet bread, like white flour bread. That's the kind I like, okay? English people like white bread. Germans and Finlandians, they like brown bread. They like, but barley is a, was a poor man's bread. So, but Jesus blessed it. And now everybody's, and, and see, the, the, to me, the, the, the reason for that, this Bible is a poor man's gospel. It wasn't made for rich people, wealthy people. It was made for the poor people. It was made for the common man. It wasn't made for kings and princes and dainty queens. It was made for the common people. Amen. And out of nothing, he blesses five loaves, two fishes, and they're pulling bread and keep pulling bread out and keep pulling bread out. And it just, they're taking as much as they can eat and everybody's full. But Jesus said, when they were filled, verse 12, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing, and he uses these two words here. What? Be lost. What does it mean to be lost? It means to be not, it means to live in Las Vegas. Except for the people that helped us with our table. 
Um, I tell you, I've never seen a place like that. And people, people of Bethel, stay out of those stupid casinos on the riverfront. I don't care if their buffet is cheap. Let them eat their own buffet. Don't, I, they don't get my business. I just, I don't go for that. Uh, we had a county executive in this county that fought off for the eight years that he ran as county executive. He fought off those casinos coming into Jefferson County successfully for eight years. Ken Waller, old friend of mine, my old insurance agent. And he said, they're not about to move into Jefferson County because I know how crooked it is. And he said, I'm not going to, while I'm county executive, they're not moving in. We don't want them in Kimswick. We don't want them in Festus. We don't want them over here in Crystal City. We don't want them. Because what it brings with it, I've seen it. You don't want it. It's wicked. It's, it's Nothing about that business is legitimate. It's all corruption. Every bit of it. Stay out of those casinos. Stay away from them. Why would you go there to begin with? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. But anyway, lost, lost, uh-oh, I think I just broke my thing here. I got to be careful. Lost is a lost man's term. Gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And what did he gather? Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets. Guess who that is? With the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. You start out with five barley loaves, and even after you fed 5,000, you've got 12 baskets that are no longer lost anymore. I'm telling you, this is a prophecy. Jesus did this story. We were told already that he knew what would, he knew how this would turn out. He knew how many how many baskets full would be left over? He knew all of these things. And he was doing it to signify to the lost sheep of Israel. I'm going to gather you once again that you're no longer lost anymore. Somebody say amen. And I don't have time to... I'm going to probably get into it tomorrow. Um, a lady that... And my wife saw it, and I and we I, I get who she is. She had the booth right next to us. Boy, how funny was that? Because she wrote a book this thick on who is God. And I th thought, well, maybe they're kind of close to what we believe. Uh-uh. She had Jezebel all over her and she wrote a book that God doesn't resurrect, he reincarnates. She was teaching reincarnation and said the Bible speaks of it all throughout the Bible in any place. And I kept reeling, throwing verses at her that disputed what she said and she said that was added in to the Bible it should have never been there I'm going how convenient that you believe this doctrine and all the verses that dispute your doctrine you say were added in there later and should have never been in there how convenient is that that's what the Jehovah's Witness did they just took out what they didn't like when it disagreed with their doctrine and uh, I felt, uh, I did, I want to say I felt sorry for her, but I didn't. Uh, as I was, you could tell what kind of spirit she had because she kept preaching to me. And when I would try to say something, she'd go, Shh. I wasn't finished yet. And I'm going, oh my goodness. But she gave me the book that night. Asked me to read the chapter that she put a bookmark in. So I scanned the chapter and I've read a few things out of it. And that's what she does. It's a simple matter of whatever doctrine disagrees with her idea that God reincarnates people. Whatever doctrine disagrees with that, like it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. 
She says, plainly, that, doctor, that verse was added in by the evil early male, male uh, church fathers who are anti-Semites and they are pro, um, what was it, she, pro-domestic violence. In other words, they hate women. And they, she said, they're the ones who are responsible for domestic violence. I said, ma'am, I said, let me tell you something about how the Apostle Paul saw the family. He told the husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. I said, that's what the Apostle Paul taught about your little family violence doctrine. Boy, I did not like her. Pray for her. Pray, you pray for her because I don't want to.